And you are listening to Triple R. A rather hectic off the record this morning, but I reckon we're going to fit in our Simon Felice interview. If you want to read about Simon, you can read Joe Roberts' excellent article about him in The Age EG yesterday. He was set to come out here a couple of years ago, but unfortunately health problems prevented him from doing so. His brothers did, of course. The Felice brothers toured before him, and Simon will be here for the Melbourne Writers Festival and some other gigs which we'll tell you about after we talk to Simon, who has a brand new novel. It's his debut novel. It's been published in Australia. You can probably, I'm, I'm certain that you can pick it up at the bookshop at the Writers' Festival, and he'll be doing a session talking about the book. Uh, the session's called Lyrical, and that will be next Thursday at the Corner Hotel at 7.30. It's kind of a show-and-tell session with uh, Kim Salmon and Laura, Jean, and they will be performing and talking about their stories. And Simon's novel is called Black Jesus. He will tell you all about that during the interview. I caught up with him just the other night He in the Catskills, and he'll tell you about that as well if you didn't know much about the Catskills of New York. Simon Felice. <laughs> I'm Simon Felice. You're listening to Off the Record. Hey, Brian. Good day. How are you? We're about to you at the moment. I'm in uh, the Catskill Mountains in north of New York City. It's where I where I grew up and where I still call home. You live fairly close to where you were born, don't you? <laughs> yeah, actually, right down right down the right down the trail, <laughs> right down the street. I was born in like an old house in the 70s you know my dad went to Woodstock Festival uh, and he never he lived in Queens New York City he went to the Woodstock Festival and he never came home <laughs> stayed up here in the mountains you know the uh, fruit hasn't fallen very far from the tree has it <laughs> hopefully hopefully it's uh, sc- it's scattered a little bit and blown a little bit on the wind <laughs> tell us a little bit about the Catskills because it features in your novel which you're going to be talking about in Melbourne at the Melbourne Writers Festival and, and elsewhere and doing some readings from and uh, it's probably a place with which we're not really familiar here in Australia very much well it's a uh, it's a mountain it's a mountainous area that looks down upon the Hudson River and the Hudson River Valley and the Hudson River was named for Henry Hudson the Dutch explorer so it's it's a really old part of uh, part of America as far as America goes and you know we fought the British all up and down the river and we built a giant chain that crossed the uh, Hudson River so the British couldn't sail their war fleet up so there's a there's an ingrained spirit of, of revolution and rebellion up here in the mountains and pe- people have their own way of doing things and you know it's a place where a lot of great poets came in the 1800s uh, to write and also painters, uh, the, the the great American um, thinker Ralph Waldo Emerson was here writing, and Henry David Thoreau and Walt Whitman, Mark Twain, they would all come through here. There was a lot of old giant, what they called mountain houses, where which were these huge hotels that sort of clung to the cliffs, and most of them have been burned down or fallen into decay. But um, this was an early history here for for writers and and artists, and um, that that history continued in the 1900s. And Bob Dylan came up here and lived in Woodstock for many years, and Jimi Hendrix lived here, and the band Van Morrison made some of his great records here. So it, it, it's still a place where, where people come, I think, re- really for the natural beauty and uh, to get the, that peace and quiet and, and sort of that earthly mysticism that you can find in the quiet woods and mountains uh, and streams. So I'm, I'm feel really fortunate that I was actually born here and, and got, got to really, really grow up in a, in a beautiful place with a lot of history. You know, obviously there's a lot of um, negative things that come along with with growing up in a in a place like this, uh, in that on the outskirts, outside of where the money is, there's a lot of um, poverty and people living in shacks and campers and and trailers and people scraping just to get by. And I grew up with a lot of people like that, and right on the fringes of that. So you know, the book that I wrote, Black Jesus, really, really a lot of it is inspired by the little town that I grew up in. I call it Gay Paris in the book, but but it's uh, really just a tiny little town in the Catskill Mountains, and uh, with a different name. (laughs) 
uh, you know, a lot of the characters are really just really inspired by people that I, I knew growing up and also different aspects of, of myself. And yeah, so, so it, it makes for a rich broth. It's a town that couldn't be further away in uh, culture from the actual gay Perry, could it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it's funny. There's all of these kind of nowhere dilapidated ghost towns up here, and they have names that evoke ancient grandeur. Like uh, right down, t- 10 minutes from my town is a town called Cairo. Ca- Cairo, <laughs> New York, like the capital of Egypt. But man... It's, uh, you know, you're lucky if you'll find, like, ten teeth between all, all of the residents. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there's a town called Rome, Rome, New York. And uh, so I was, in, <laughs> I was inspired by sort of the, um, the ironic nature of that naming of the towns up here. So I wanted to name my town after a, a, a grand city. So, okay, Paris, New York. It's a fascinating book, and the main character is possibly someone that you might find in one of those towns up there. Yeah, honestly, the main character is inspired by a, a friend of mine who, who did go to fight in Iraq. And just a, a, a really good kid. I knew him since we were little, really little children. And uh, he signed up for the Marines just so he could go to college or get some health insurance or whatever they promise you, you know, because a lot of times it's hard to, to get good work, you know. And, and he figured it was a steady job, and his father had been in Vietnam. So there was a history of... Uh, history of, of violence but uh he came back from iraq scarred um but it was the kind of scars that you can't see the emotional and, and psychological trauma and scars that people go home with that sometimes can be more painful than the physical one so i wanted to write a story about you know the traumas of war and about you know at the end of the day we have all we have new technology to give people new hands and and feet and drugs to make them feel better or whatever. But, you know, after all all of these thousands of years of us hacking each other to pieces over land or gold or oil or whatever, one of the most important medicines still is love. Love is really probably the most important. And and that's what I wanted to write a story about, you know, how love can can save your life or at least at least help you to see see that life is worth living and so it's about a blind boy that my story and uh, what i hoped was that he could find a new way to see maybe maybe a way to see that he had never known about before he even lost his sight the person who helps him do that is gloria of course the other main character in the novel yes indeed is she based on someone you <laughs> knew up there i suppose we, the temptation yeah. is to think that all the characters are yeah she's she's inspired by a, a girl i knew who was a stripper and uh, she was running away from that life. And uh, she wanted to be a dancer, a modern dancer. But it was hard for her to say no to her job in you know, strip clubs because she could make so much money there and, and nowhere else could she really really make a, a living. So um, she was torn because she didn't really enjoy it. But um, it was a way for her to, to get by. So it was that sort of struggle that I was really inspired by her, her story that she shared with me. And, and I wanted to, to write about that. And I, I just... I wanted these two people to come together, so I um, I tried to paint that picture the best that I could. And you paint it beautifully. And the main character is his name is Lionel White. He's called Black Jesus by his friends. It's a it's a nickname that sticks. He arrives home from the war, and if it wasn't bad enough what he went through, he gets home and he finds things that are a bit uh, topsy turvy when he gets home. He he doesn't go to the home that he thought he was going to, does he? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, his mother, uh, you know, she's a special character she's a she's a loner she's a rebel and uh she she has her own way of doing things and she's called fat debbie and uh she runs a junk shop which all of lionel's life this was the way she made a living she she got hand-me-down uh pieces of clothing and articles of you know from people's uh when people would die (laughs) she would go get their stuff like estate sales and then sell them you know like anything from silverware to tricycle to keys or uh, a painting well many things and, and when you when you read the book you'll see what kind of a cornucopia her her yard sale bazaar is and she loves her boy so much in her own way he grew up without a father and and it was just her and him so when she found out that he he was injured you know she wanted to find a way to welcome him home to a place where he could really maybe feel okay and, and feel comfortable. And, and they had always lived in a, in a trailer. 
and uh, she wanted something better for him. So the Dairy Queen, which was uh, growing up in New York, it's like a it's a classic uh, summertime place to go for ice cream, and it's it's just a real kind of staple of of American childhood. So the, there's a Dairy Queen uh, right by me where I grew up, and it's since gone out of business since I was a kid, and now it just sits there and it's empty. And so I figured uh, in the story I wanted. I wanted um, Lionel White, Black Jesus' mom, to, to buy this empty Dairy Queen and make it into their house. So <laughs> that's just what she does. And uh, when he comes home, he's blind, and she brings him home, and all of a sudden, he doesn't live in a trailer anymore. He lives in the old Dairy Queen, which is a, a, an interesting building. It, it has like a, a garret or a crow's nest, a strange little attic. Um, it looks kind of like a farm, like a, build, like a barn at a farm. And... Um, she built him a little special bedroom in the in the attic in the crow's nest, and that's how the story starts. Duke and the King from their recent album, Hudson River. We're talking to Simon Felice. I'm Simon Felice. You're listening to Off the Record. You've got some terrific reviews for the novel already. Um, Some of them have commented about the way in which you portray the kind of death of the American dream, but I'm not, I'm not sure that American dream actually existed for the people about whom you write and people in those towns. <laughs> good good point, Brian. Yeah, I guess, the, I suppose the American dream has always really been a, been a bit of a farce or a bit of a, um, a calling card, uh, uh, an advertisement for immigrants to come. I mean, that's how it, it really started. I mean, the streets are paved with gold. You know, that's what they would say. And thousands of people would jump on a boat from Ireland or Italy or, you know, now Mexico and Guatemala and the Middle East. And, you know, the immigrants change uh, color and change ethnicity and and change um, uh, where they're from and and their customs. But the the essence of why they come doesn't change. And it really is to to find a better life. And I think oftentimes that, that better life... You know, it, it, you can find it if you work hard, I suppose. But um, you know, my I was uh, uh, grew up a you know second generation Irish um, from an Irish immigrant family, so um, it seemed like a, America was a, a refuge for people, and ho- hopefully it still is in a way. But um, you know, it, it's not the, the Hollywood uh, dream of you're going to step off the boat and and become a, a uh, Henry Ford <laughs> or or uh, you know Madonna or anything like that. <laughs> But you know, you know, you never know. I, I guess, I guess there is still, still a bit of that myth still exists. But yeah, the characters in my book have, have been in America for a while, and it wasn't really doing them any favors. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the sa- um, yeah, and, and the soundtrack, uh, if there was a soundtrack to the book, is certainly not one that you might ch- choose. It's a soundtrack of um, of songs of uh, the day that uh, of, of which you write and uh, music that. Uh, possibly um well you obviously don't play but you've had to choose those songs that are important to the characters yeah well you know i was a kid i was a little kid in the 1980s and man i didn't have, there was no ipod and there was no uh, <laughs> cable radio and no youtube the only way to listen to music was to listen to the radio or if somebody had a tape they would give you but gr- my, growing up for me it was just you heard what was on the radio and it was it was the hits of the day or it was the uh you know the classic rock classic rock of the 70s and the 80s you know so that that music is ingrained in my brain and i know that it is in 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 the, in the brains of the people that that i grew up with and um you know lionel's mom she can't shake the 80s you know it's 2010 in the book you know 2011 yeah. now you know but she can't shake she can't <laughs> shake uh you know the Thompson Twins and um, and uh, Phil Collins and uh, Lionel Richie. I mean, she she named her child after Lionel Richie. <laughs> and of course, she quotes the lyrics to the songs as if they were written by Shakespeare. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, Phil Collins is a bit of a Shakespeare character in in my novel. Um, 